Um, so my name is Mona Hassan. Um, I'm currently a student at Westminster studying politics and IR. Uh, and just very briefly, um, the reason why I got into politics and stuff like that was really um, kind of focusing on um, wanting to move back home to Somalia and wanting to transfer the skills and whatever from uni to um, back home. Uh, but as you all know, uh, the saying goes, charity starts at home. And so we have Somalia here, we have loads of Somalis here in London. So I'm really kind of focusing on working with different groups and communities that focus on um, issues relevant to Somalis here in uh, London particularly. Um, so I'm very passionate about mental health, do some work around that. Uh, but for this particular event, I wanted to talk about something that isn't talked about a lot. Um, but more so talked about together, right? So there's two issues I wanted to touch on uh, very quickly. Uh, one of them was that a lot of Somalis, a lot of Somalis, um, young Somalis in school particularly, are getting excluded, right? Um, so that's something that's talked about in circles and families and community centers. So that's something we all know about. And there's another issue of Somalis overpopulating prisons in the UK. Um, now again, there's a lot of work around that as well, a lot of research, a lot of communities work around that. But in all my research and all my kind of readings, I'm yet to see anyone kind of connecting the two issues, right? So in my research and a lot of other studies I looked at, there seems to exist a link between young troubled kids getting excluded from schools and them ending up in a uh, criminal justice system, either young offender institutions or um, adult prisons. Um, so a report I looked at um, by the Council of Somali Organisations in its State of Education um, report in 2015 found that Somalis have some of the highest exclusion rates in London. Um, each community organisation that was involved in the report said that each organisation had about 12 to 15 different cases every single month. You do the math. Um, and some of the biggest contributing factors they found to this issue was that a lot of Somalis or young Somalis tend to come from uh, backgrounds with low socio-economic kind of coming from low socio-economic backgrounds, um, low academic achievement in families and also a language barrier that exists between students and families and then also families and schools. Um, there's a term that's often used in the US called the school to prison pipeline. And what this term essentially means is that young children or young kids are pushed out of the education system and pushed into the criminal justice system. It's used a lot in the US, but more recently, um, a lot of activists and organizations started to use that term and apply that term to some of the issues we have here in London. Now, um, the school to prison pipeline tends to include two groups and these groups include uh, people from racial minority backgrounds and people with special educational needs. Um, also another report I looked at by the NSPCC from 2009 on uh, teenagers at risk, they looked at the type of people that tend to be attracted to gang violence and um, uh, kind of violence on the streets um, generally and they cited uh, school exclusion uh, as being one of the key factors um, that drives young people out on the streets and hence offending. Um, so young people from Afro-Caribbean backgrounds are more affected by gun and knife crime than any other group. And even more so recently over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of that, a lot of increase of that in the Somali community, a lot of gun and knife crime Somali communities. And a lot of these violence tends to be against one another. I'm sure everyone here knows of a family, if not affected by it directly, of a young Somali person who lost their lives at the hands of another Somali. Um, Feltham, which is a young offenders institution here in London, um, actually, has Somalis as one of the biggest foreign groups in its prison, right? Um, I, I guess we make up about 0.49% of the population here in London, and we make up as the largest foreign group in a young offenders institution. It's a huge, huge problem. Um, 
Dr. Karen Graham, who worked as an English teacher in two adult male prisons, found that a lot, of, a lot of the inmates she was interviewing upon arrival into prisons found that a lot of them had very low kind of educational backgrounds. And what she did was she um, conducted a study whereby she intensively interviewed and researched into 11 uh, inmates' lives. And what she found was that every single male she'd interviewed, they'd all been excluded from school. Right? So again, the cycle starts from schools and, you know, I mean, it, it's a process, right? So getting excluded from school and ending up in the criminal justice system, it's a process, but it definitely um, starts from some place. In a lot of these cases, they tend to start with uh, school exclusions. That's not to say that every single person who's excluded will end up in the criminal justice system, or that everyone in the criminal justice system has faced exclusion, but as many of these reports do indicate, there exists a link. Um, and those, those are just some of the issues I looked at, and also some of the solutions we could look into for these issues. Um, Nora talked about autism in um, the Somali community, and I previously thought autism was, was a, a mental illness. Um, but a lot of expelled students, or I think the report um, states, uh, the Guardian put out last year, that half of all expelled students um, have mental health issues. And I think they classify special education needs as mental illness in this particular report. But again, another astounding fact that half of all expelled students have mental health issues. Now, mental health is something we don't, as a community necessarily, and I say particularly the olders in the community, don't necessarily accept as a disorder or accept as a condition. Uh, but it's something that's very, very prevalent in the Somali community. Um, and so, again, there's a link between mental health issues and the mistreatment of that, and the mistreatment of, of, of generally blacks and uh, people from ethnic minority backgrounds who are criminalized um, and then end up in a criminal justice system. So again, there's a link there. Um, also, um, I, um, so the same report I quoted earlier from the NSPCC um, looked at some of the solutions teachers and families and so on could focus on, and they suggested um, so less punitive actions for troubled children or people with behavioural or disability problems, and more kind of interventionist um, approaches involving support workers, families, um, in kind of intervening in that young person's life before exclusion and before kind of leaving school and then getting in trouble out on the streets and so on and so forth. Because a lot of the efforts we kind of Somali communities today tend to kind of focus on tend to be after the acts occurred. So after the child's been excluded, a lot of community organisations tend to get involved. Um, but I think a lot of focus needs to be put on preventative measures where we can look or interrupt these young people's um, lives before they're expelled um, and before they end up going down a dark path. Um, I also think um, teachers, um, so a lot of the reports also looked at, um, tend to put the blame at ineffective teacher training. Um, so teachers not having a lot of cultural understanding um, of some of the students they teach. Um, that, that tends to be in, in an a issue in a lot of uh, Western countries Somalis live in. There's a huge cultural barrier between students and teachers, um, which overall affects the students' academic achievement, so on. Um, I think that's all. I had some questions posted up, but I think Fosia will be doing that. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what I wanted to kind of put out there because I know we had parents, young professionals, students and so on coming together to this particular event and I mean these two issues are issues that exist. A lot of them exist at the moment separately in our community but there's definitely a link between the two and I think it takes a whole bunch of us, young professionals, family members, community organisations to come together and really demand this from the government, demand more effective teacher training, uh, more effective um, kind of approaches dealing with young children in schools before they end up um, in the system, be that the criminal justice system, be that mental health, so on and so forth. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for advice by Aisha. Thank you very much. Um, just want to say hello to everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, mashallah today. Uh, 
the conversation we discussed is a very interesting one. My name is Zahra Ahmed, I'm a solicitor. Um, I'm not a criminal solicitor, I'm a litigation solicitor, but um, obviously I deal with a lot of issues that happen within the Somali community and a large part of it is related to mental health, it's related to the criminal justice system. So I'm glad today I'm listening to these lovely young ladies and um, hearing what they've got to say. So I'm assuming a lot of you have questions and uh, hopefully we can discuss it. Yes, we'll get to the questions. Uh, <laughs> I see you're trying to escape, Zahra. Um, I have a question. I don't know if you have the answer to this. Uh, do we know why um, Somalis specifically get excluded from school? What, what are they doing? Um, I mean, from my limited access, um, again, to the education system, and uh, uh, you know, um, education law, um, I think a lot of Somali young children uh, from young age they start having behavioral problems which is linked to their mental health sometimes. There is no access to services. I think a lot of uh, Somali parents misunderstand that, um, I mean, we've got one word for mental health which is welly, welling haken, and a lot of parents are quite afraid of that word attached. It's, it's kind of stigmatized and they don't want their children to be attached to that. So uh, children having behavioral issues, ADH, things like that, mm -hmm. they don't seek medical attention at all. Then the problems start from, I mean, a lot of kids that I see, they're like eight, nine, ten. By the mm -hmm. time they get to high school, obviously, the child is not receiving the attention and the treatment that they require. And, and in turn, what happens is, obviously, they get into trouble, uh, they get excluded, and so on, and so on, and so on, and then they get into fights to wrong friends. Uh, next thing that we know is that the child's been shipped back to Somalia or Somaliland. Um, I mean, we're having a lot of problems with what's called Dakan um, Elis. Again, when you're dealing with uh, a child with mental health issue, it's not about rehabilitation, it's about getting the right treatment. Right. So um, then by the time this child comes back at age 16, 17, it's too late. And <coughs> seeing a lot of young children, um, they get in trouble with the police, um, uh, they're committing crimes, um, but they can't use, for example, uh, a defense uh, based on mental health or their mental health illnesses because there's nothing on the records. There's absolutely nothing on the records because the parents fear uh, mm -hmm. are telling the GB or, or getting help for that child. And what happened is that obviously it's too late uh, by the time that defense of, uh, for example, insanity or uh, defense based on any mental health uh, uh, depression, things like that, there's no records to back it up. There is no evidence to support that defense. And I mean, uh, Munna has mentioned about uh, youth offenders uh, institutions and uh, there's a large groups of Somali youth in there. Again, what happens is that a lot of young people, they go in there with or without mental health, but when they come out, there is no support. There is no one to talk to about what takes place, what happened, their experiences. And what happens is that they go into drugs, they go into drinking, committing more crimes. Right. And once you get into the criminal system, obviously, it just goes... Uh, you're in a cycle. Yes. Yeah, you're back in. So it's difficult for us to break the cycle. Um, and I think uh, what's happening is uh, the first step, obviously, is that we're having this conversation. We're talking about mental health. We're talking about the criminal justice system. We're talking about the link between the two. Uh, the next step would be, as a community, that we really understand the all sorts of mental health illnesses. Right. And um, each and every one of them doesn't mean someone is suffering from madness or is crazy or that family should be shunned or that family should be isolated. It doesn't mean like that. I have actually seen people saying, so and so, that family, we shouldn't marry their daughters or, or, or you know, mm -hmm. because they've got mental health illnesses. Uh, so I, I can understand why parents are hesitant. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we're having this conversation and hopefully this is something we can talk as a community in public and provide support uh, and not st stigmatize or isolate those families. What kind of support is there? Do either of you know? Mm. So let's say um, um, there's an exclusion that takes mm. place. What happens to that child in their education? If they're permanently ex excluded, is there an alternative educational system? Mm -hmm. And is that easy for a Somali family then to tap into? Because if this boy or girl does not enter that system, then they're on the road, as they say. Yeah. And 
they get into trouble and they join. I, you know, part of what disturbs me about all of this is uh, we were talking about this 12 years ago. I was in Feltham a lot 12 years ago, mm -hmm. and the numbers were very high at the time. And I don't see anything changing. So is the problem us, that we're actually not doing anything about this? Or because a, a lot of the time, we can't keep saying we have a stigma and we have a problem with shame. We need to get rid of our stigma and this problem with shame mm -hmm. and make sure that our young children are okay. Because we know that as a as a black child or a black boy mm -hmm. who's walking down the road, he is eight times more likely to be stopped. And if he's done, he's up to no good, and he's eight times more likely to be stopped, he is going to get into the hands of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And they're tougher on black boys, let's face it. Yeah. What are we waiting for? Like two, three generations of them just being inside, coming out and having mental health issues, coming back to us, and us shunning them, and just being a society that splits. Where does, where does the buck stop? Who needs to do what? To be honest with you, um, I can't answer where the buck stops. Uh, but um, I know within, I mean, a lot of us, we've got sons and we've got brothers and we've got nephews. And we obviously know um, uh, what happens. I mean, I've got nephews. And some of the conversations that I have, the 15, 16, 17, is I actually sit down and tell them what to do. They stopped what their rights are. How so they need to be informed, yes. Who to call, uh, yeah. what card to carry. So I think as a community, what we need to do, we need to educate our sons and our brothers and our husbands and, uh, you know, our men, for example, because as black men, they get stopped, they get this, get, they get that. But I think our, our problems go beyond that. Uh, and our problem is mainly is, um, I have actually seen very recently a young boy, um, a 15 year old, um, he was with a group of boys and they were on a bicycle. Obviously, you know what happened uh, in the state. Um, the police was approaching, so they ran. They haven't done anything. Right, yeah. But they ran. Yeah. The police chased, uh, they jumped uh, on a couple of fences, this, this, that, and he ended up being severely injured because he, uh, he fell down and he crushed his skull and he ended up having a brain injury. Obviously, with a case like that, he wasn't carrying a knife, he didn't have a weapon, he didn't have drugs with him. It, it was just a, a misunderstanding. I mean, Well, I'd run if someone chased me. I, I don't know if I'd run if the police chased me, but I, you're, you're a young person, you know as a black boy yeah. Yeah. what the situation is with yeah. the police. I have four brothers. Yeah. My brothers have been beat up in the back of a van mm. and they haven't told my mother because it'll upset my mother. And then you find out 20 years later that yeah. all those bruises back then, yeah. I didn't get into a fight with my friend. The yeah. police hit me. And you're 14, 13 year old boys bundled into a back of vans. You will run. Yeah, that, that is true. But what we need to tell them is, if you haven't done anything wrong, right. don't run. Wait. Absolutely. When they ask you, I mean, the first question they always ask is that, oh, you resemble a description that we have. Yeah. Then you have to ask them, what kind of a description would that be? Would that be the color of my skin, for example? Yeah. So what we need to do is that we need to enable our young men, yeah. the boys, we need to, uh, they need to be aware of what their rights are. And, and this is, I mean, I only have to look at my own life, at my own uh, family, just to know how much young boys actually fear the police, and, mm. and, and for all the right reasons sometimes. Um, so my, what I'm trying to say to you is that, I mean, this is not a problem that's going to stop today or tomorrow, but what we need to do is that we need to educate the community, we need to understand, we need to be open about things. We're not all criminals. There are some, there's some good yeah. people, but even when young people commit crime, we shouldn't just write them off. No. They can come back from it. There yes. is a rehabilitation in place. But um, I met years and years and years ago, there was a group of young Somali boys that were actually visiting prisons and uh, youth centers and uh, youth detention centers and things like that. They were, they were trying to offer a, a big brother kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to talk to those boys because a lot of things goes on while they are uh, um, in jail yeah. or, or while they're in prison. Some of them are sexually assaulted. We don't want to talk about it no. as a community. A lot of young boys got into trouble using drugs, selling drugs. There's initiation programs in place. <coughs> Mostly it's got something to do with sexual abuse. Again, we can't talk about it because we tell our boys, yeah. you're a man. No, yeah. he's not a man, he's a boy. He's 14, right. he's 15. Right. But we need to warn that child 
about what's out there. We're not having a, that conversation at all. They come out of it, they abuse, they can't come out and say, Hoya Abu, this is what happened to me. Because we don't tolerate. We don't we have to, we don't create the environment for yeah, it. Yeah. We don't tolerate at all. So uh, what we do is, uh, um, obviously, to cope with what has happened to them, they go back to the drug. Yeah. The cycle is never ending. They can't break out of it. So um, I think at the community, there is a conversation we have to have. Uh, that conversation we consider a shameful conversation. Um, um, then we, get, we also have the anger of the parent towards their children sometimes. Yes. Um, we think like they failed us, they shamed us. I mean, yeah. uh, everybody makes a mistake. Uh, sometimes I find, I got a call of a family that really, really upset in the middle of the night, this happened, that happened, that happened. And you actually see the problem that that family have is not with the police or with the school or with the social services. The problem they have is with their own children. It's a lack of communication. Right. And this is something that they could actually sit down and sort it out. So I think there's so many different ways that you can link things together. But as a community, I think what we need to do is we need to talk about the elephant in the room. We, we have a few elephants happened. in the room that we we're try and avoid. Yeah, yeah. We're, not, we're no longer in Somalia. We're no longer in Somaliland. The problems that we have are the problems that every other community in the UK has. Yes. We need to talk about that. And, and, and a lot of people think that the solution is sending them back home. Back home, what are you sending them back home to? And then they send it and then they send a lot of money to them. You can get anything that you like oh, back yeah. home. And on top of that, they will actually be with a lot of people who are traumatized. So they will actually find uh, yeah. people who are like-minded. Yes. Um, so the solution is not that. The solution is not uh, sending young people back home, only for them to come back when they're 18 and say, sorry, I'm not staying in that place. Yeah. The solution is not that. I think we need to sort things out here. We need to start at home. The communication has to be there. Uh, we need to warn children, to educate them, to enable them. So um, on top of that, uh, I think Muna have mentioned about um, services for those young people. I'm sure there's some, yes. but we don't know where to go. Do you know of any, Muna? Specifically, let's say, at the point of exclusion, is there an organisation, maybe even Somali organisations that work with parents and families that are facing exclusion so that child does mm -hmm. not get stuck in this yeah. loop and then end up down that pipeline yeah. into yeah. the prison system? Or do we know even of any organisations that work with uh, people, young people who have offended and support them through the process? Because I think to leave it just to be within the family units, I think, is a big Mm -hmm. big ask not every family has the capability to do that I think it gets so um, it's such a highly emotive subject like you said there's a lot of anger a lot of resentment um, it's it's a shame that when I used to go to Feltham 10 11 years ago um, I, I'm so embarrassed to say that even when your boy is 16 years old and he's offended for the first time and he's not even being told that he's guilty no one comes to see him I'm not talking mom and dad, I'm talking about where are your mates? Mm. Where are your 50,000 up to your aderos? Mm. Where is everybody? And I had to go and sit in front of young boys who had no one call or come and see them. So how do you think they're going to come out of this if you hide away in the community and say, oh, the way you are, they to, uh, obviously, to, uh, I don't know, on some kind of an adventure, but he's stuck somewhere. He may want to stop doing what he's done. It may, he may have fallen into it in some way. But if he doesn't have access in that family support network, how is he going to cope? And if we can't rely on us within, within ourselves as a family to do it, we need to set up organisations that make sure these the young people are supported. Do we know of any? And if we don't, we're going to ask you guys in a second. I think from my understanding is um, there isn't any kind of group set up to deal with this issue. But I think we've got hundreds of community centres or organisations, yeah. Somali centres in London. And I think um, they do this kind of work on a voluntary basis or because a family member's gone to them and spoke to right. them about it. But I think another thing here is, I think as Somali people, we're very proud. We're very prideful people. Yeah. And I think the word hishod comes in a lot of kind of the things 
you know, um, young people tend to kind of be involved in. There's that whole stigma thing you were talking about. If a boy's out on the street stealing drugs, it's not something we can openly talk about because it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's a bad thing to do. We can't share that with the rest of our family members. Um, so I think, I think breaking that Hishod wall, and the fact, because the fact of the matter is a lot of our kids are really out here um, struggling. You know, we're not just, I mean, it's an event and it's a thing to, to be talked about when our child graduates from uni and they've mm -hmm. got a career, it's something we all celebrate. But we're not just in schools and universities and workplaces, we're also in, in prisons, we're also in hospitals, we're also yes. out on the streets. Mm -hmm. And it's not a thing that only boys do. A lot of girls are also out here, a lot of Absolutely. girls are in prison, Absolutely. a lot of girls Absolutely. are out on the streets. And again, if it's hishod for a boy to do this, what about a girl? Yeah. Imagine a girl that's in prison or a girl that's been excluded. No one will talk about it. Yeah. The mum will be afraid to talk about it. The dad won't. So it's, I think, like you said, breaking down that wall and, uh, you know. No, I absolutely agree. Um, it's, um, I, you mentioned about Somali communities providing similar services. But to be honest with you, their services is limited to making phone calls sometimes. Um, I mean, they helping with the language barriers sometimes, and uh, calling the police, calling this, calling that. That's how they help the family. I mean, one thing I know is that at the moment there are quite few Somali social workers. There are mm -hmm. quite few that I know of personally who are mental health uh, are professionals. Yeah, happy to help. Uh, we've got quite few Somali doctors. We've got loads of nurses working in the mental health sector. Uh, all those people are quite prepared to offer help. But the problem is, again, we come back to the shaming thing. Yeah. Um, um, a couple of months ago, I saw this lady, and there was a problem with the family. And there were seven children under the age of 12 in the house. Mm -hmm. So obviously, social services were involved. There were drugs. Uh, one of the sons was doing that. Um, they were abused, they were violent, they were all sorts of things. And social services, this was a very unique case. They actually found a Somali-speaking social worker. Right. Do you know what the mother said? Yeah, she no, said, no. Uh, which basically means that she's gunning for me. Right. And, and that young social worker, basically, she was really trying <laughs> to convince the mother to accept help the services so she could keep her young children, children with together. Her. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why that mother was angry was she was asked that her new husband couldn't be in the house while allegations of abuse were investigated. So at the end I was like, okay, hmm. you keep those kids and he goes out for a couple of months or those kids go into care. And you There's keep nothing him. in between that. Is this young lady saying anything different than that? No, <laughs> she is telling you what the rules are. But no, she couldn't see it. All she could see is that young Somali social worker who would really try in her best to keep that family together. So what we really need to do is that, um, mm. obviously, we need to see it as a blessing when we see a, a Somali person right. who is a professional involved in our case trying to help us. Um, this is what another reason why there's not much help available in terms of professional help I'm talking about, or information available, because the families are not willing to work with those people. Um, they worried, and I mean, you cannot imagine how uh, every day I spend two, three phone calls just explaining to people about confidentiality. I, I explain to them, whatever you tell me, I could not repeat it to someone else. Sometimes I have to say, like, you know, a doctor, a nurse, uh, a solicitor, a barrister, and Nika, can you say the joke? I cannot tell what you tell them. <laughs> I have to tell them that. They don't understand that those people are not allowed yeah. to repeat what they see or what they hear in the community at large. They don't want to. No one wants yeah, to. Yeah, they think there will be gossip as yeah, a result of this. There is no, person. but again, we're coming back to the stigma. So um, you mentioned something very interesting about uh, uh, the lack of support from family, from friends, from community once bad things happen. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when young people go to prison. Um, another thing that I see sometimes is that a lot of families, they don't understand when a young person is in prison, for example, in, in, in Wales. There's such things as making an application for them to try to transfer them, them closer, closer to, to the home. family. Yeah. They don't know. So yeah. obviously it's difficult for them to go two, three hours a train ride away to see. So 
that young child or, or a young yeah. person, they uh, become very much disassociated with the community, with the family. They've got a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of, okay, I made a mistake, but... Yeah, let's move on from yeah. this. So, um, so I, I think it just keeps coming back. And, and in reality, I think what we're looking into at the moment is um, finding the services, finding services with Somali professionals at times, but also people have to be willing to accept the help, the help. that's available to them. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Mariam, and my question is for um, Nora, the, the section on autism. Um, just a quick question. Um, in terms of like the campaign stuff that you've been doing, and you know the work and the organising overall, I would just like to ask: at any part of the process that you've been engaged with work to do with autism, have you in any way engaged with adults with autism and how they live on the spectrum and generally speaking um, other autistic self-identified autistic activists or people that are involved in grassroots work who, who self-identify as work with them so I, come, I, I came across a couple of people who are on the spectrum um, who are an adult. Um, the few that I come across were severely autistic to the point that um, they had no language, had 24-7 support, um, but with the right support, since mo the mother has been involved with our group, has now... Um, making a f slowly and slowly progress. Um, there's another young man that I come across who had autism, but now you cannot really see that he has autism, but he doesn't want to talk about that he had autism or the family doesn't talk about it. Um, so, yes. Is that, did that answer your question? Or did I miss... Sorry? Yes, so d I did come across, but it's very few. Um, under the Autism Independence, uh, Independence Membership, we've got over 56 families, um, and about five of the families have got adults with autism over 18. Yeah, so apart from one, the rest are severely autistic. And these would be families who were at that time when there was no mention of the autism. And you can obviously see clearly no early intervention that they've received. I was wondering if it's too late for someone with <coughs> autism to receive help, like if they're in their teens and, and, you know, they, and they can't speak or they have zero social issues because they were hidden for so long. Is it too late for them to receive the help for them to be able to cope with everyday life? Yeah. Um, it's never too late for them to make progress, but obviously what we know, children up to seven, their brain are at that point where they observe everything and that, you know, autism, you know, the early interventions, catching children at a younger age, is better for them to make progress, but it is never too late. And I would strongly um, advise at any point that you feel a young person has got any threats or any signs of autism to try and seek help. There are adult services out there. So a question from Muna. Um, like, as an educator, I was wondering what can schools do to prevent the minority from getting excluded and, if, and basically for them to just be um, avoiding them end ending up in prisons and stuff like that? I think, um, I think a good place to start would be um, providing effective teacher training for teachers um, initially. Um, so kind of ways or effective ways to deal with um, children who are displaying kind of behavioural or emotional um, kind of difficulties. Uh, but also um, I think um, 
a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers that teach our young children tend to be kind of very distant, very foreign to them, right? So you'll find maybe schools in predominantly black and Asian kind of communities and all the teachers are white, right? How are these teachers, oh, sorry, students supposed to relate to these teachers in any kind of shape or form? So I guess employing also a lot of teachers that reflect the students that they teach. Um, we need, I know we've got like a lot of uh, young Somalis are going into teaching, um, you know, um, but I think um, employing more kind of Somali sorry, uh, teachers from those kind of backgrounds and um, providing, I guess, more therapeutic services. A lot of these children kind of, you know, have difficulties. They come from troubled families and the only way they can act out on these things is to kind of go to school and go crazy, right? And we know what happens when they tend to do that. So maybe kind of providing more intervention services, uh, including families in these kind of um, services, um, I think would be um, a, a good good thing to do or a good place to start. Hello. Um, I just want to briefly comment on the question you had earlier about services first. Um, there are, there's not many kind of Somali adult autistic people that I'm aware of, but I know um, that one person I recently saw was Dina. So Dina, she's a lady, she did a program, um, a film on what it's like with adults with autism. And in terms of research-wise, that is a big lacking area in terms of how do these children go from early years into adolescence and to being grown adults. So I think that's something that we are um, looking into the field. I'm, I actually work with children with autism, I'm a speech therapist. So I think it's really important that although these adults might be functioning well, they are always going to have needs. And I think as adults, it's all about being independent. So still bearing in mind, if you do see someone with some communication difficulties, that although they might be functioning well, that they might need that extra support and not, not kind of completely dismissing it. Um, my question and comment is to Noura, I think it's really fascinating, interesting for you to be able to share your personal experience um, on, on kind of like a more personal level to me. I wanted to know if now that you are more actively, active, um, kind of being an active, an advocate for autism, have you seen that parents in the Bristol community are more open and more receptive to engaging with services and seeing it can be okay, or do you think there's still quite a long way to go? I definitely see some more, more and more families coming forward. So when we started Autism Independence, there were about eight, eight families who came on board. We've now got 56 families under our membership. Um, and, and the fact that SAC has made progress and is within the community and you know part of all the things that's happening really encourage other families to come forward, you know, get in touch and ask questions. And, and that has been a real sort of like um, an, a stuff for families um, and, and the play that we I think that play has um, been in screen and in group about five six times in Bristol now um, more like, more like almost ten, yeah. ten, so about ten times we went to different parts of of Bristol with different and uh, where we where they had more communities and, and, and take this, this sort of the play to it. And that really has made a lot of families to think about it. Uh, and I really hope that we would see other parts of, you know, in the UK that, you know, there would be more and more sort of um, workshops and, 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 and that, you know, take the play as well. Me is Dr. Haji, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a vet. Uh, I hope many, many of you will wonder why I have come to this. <laughs> where there are no animals to treat, really. Uh, uh, my intervention uh, relates to the presentation given by Muna. Uh, uh, in relation to my experience as a school governor for the last six years uh, in a high school in West London, uh, I believe that uh, I agree with her, I concur with her, the fact that uh, there is a relationship, a direct correlation between exclusion Berman, particularly Berman exclusion from schools and the uh, uh, young people being ending up in prison. That I really have a certain experience, I've witnessed it myself. Uh, if I, give, I can give you uh, uh, one example, in our school in which I have been uh, a school governor, uh, we have a school, a ch Somali children, a school population of 13 percent, and uh, the Melbourne exclusion goes to 35 percent. So you can imagine how uh, the Somali children are more vulnerable in relation to other school children being excluded permanently in school. 
And the majority of those are, that has been excluded permanently and um, in prison because they are they have been uh, uh, thrown out into the into the open and into the streets. Uh, and they have only two choices when they are come to the street. Really, they can they either go to the mosque, be a rebel, or and they have been in Syria uh, or, or, or 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 other uh, you know uh, other places like 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 Iraq or uh, to fight uh, as a member of Al Qaeda. Or they go to drug lords and then end up at the end uh, in prison. So there's no, uh, most of them, I think 80% of them either end, I mean, those two areas. Uh, I think the, the problem lies not only with the teachers, lack of understanding to the school and to the cultures of their students, uh, particularly the uh, ethnic minority students. But it also lies in the lack of understanding of the Somali parents, particularly of the school systems that they have brought their children in. They believe their responsibility lies, you know, feeding and taking care of their children at home, bringing them to school, and that is it. There is a lack of, uh, you know, understanding the school system that they have brought their children in. They don't participate in school activities. There is, there is no, there is a need for a kind of triangular relationship between the school authorities, children's parents, and this, the communities of, ethnic, uh, of the ethnic minorities, that these three, if they work together, and uh, you know, uh, the, then the, this problem can, can, can be solved. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, 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 it will continue. Another factor which, in fact, plays a big role in permanent exclusion of Somali children, particularly in the school I was working for, I was working as a school governor, is the fact that you know teenage children when they are brought to the country, after they have after they have lost at least four or five years of their schooling, uh, they are put into a, a class of their age. For example, a child of 16, when he, uh, a young boy of 16 years old, he is put into a class of uh, year 11. Perhaps his level of education uh, corresponds to a class way way lower than that one, perhaps year nine. Uh, so what happens? He doesn't understand what's going on. He's been teased by other children that were here, that have, were born either in, Uke, uh, in Britain or in, uh, in that area. Uh, and then he, you know, he comes from a culture whereby if someone teases you or says uh, something that you don't really are happy with, uh, you, 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 you return it by, by violence, uh, you see. So then he's booked, he's brought in. For, his, for the first time, and then he continues to do the same thing uh, the following day, and then at the end, they, he will be sent out permanently uh, out of school, and he ends up in the street, and then into prison later on. I think there is a need, therefore, for the parents to understand the school system in which their children are. Secondly, they need to be more active uh, and participate in school activities. For example, uh, parents' evening, they don't come, most of them. Uh, they have to go, go there to see the teachers, discuss, be open to the teachers, understand what's going on, uh, and also help the school so that they can help their children. Uh, the, I think these are certain areas I think I would like to, uh, you know, uh, hope that, you know, researchers <coughs> like Muna need to look at. Not only the fact that, you know, the school, uh, uh, the responsibility also lies with the parents, it's, it's, it lies also with the children, it's also the uh, the economic status of the family itself as well. I think uh, the, the, this is a multitude of issues which need to be addressed rather to one of them. Thank you. Um. Uh, one of my friends has got a seven-year-old boy. He repeatedly asks the same question over and over again, very, very repeatedly. Do you think it, that is a classic symptom of autism? Um. Repeating things is one of the signs of autism. I would strongly ask that, I, I would advise that um, maybe consult your GB and then they advise, to, they ask you to um, see a pediatrician who would then do an assessment and then refer him and, 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 a, and a team. But consistent repeating of something is, is one of the classic symptoms of autism. Um, but I would, yeah, go back to the you know GP or health visitor or sort of the um, school sanco, and then 
just really highlighting that this is what happens. Sometimes in the past, I would take a little video and then I would take it to the medical professionals and for them to see what I'm trying to, t what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about, uh, what I'm trying to say. Um, so yeah, definitely that repeating would be a concern. So well done to all the panel members, well done. Um, basically, uh, in terms of autism, Um, in the Somali and deaf community as well, um, there's a lot of autism and there's a lot of mental health issues going on as well. With the deaf community, there's always communication breakdowns going on, there's always parental communication breakdowns going on. Um, that means that the deaf person may run away, abscond from their family home because of these barriers. So they may go off with and find a, 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 rela a relationship outside of the religious practices maybe. There's no real education out there for the Somalian deaf community. Is there help for the Somalian deaf community outside? To be honest, thank you so much for highlighting that. This for me, this is the first time I've actually heard of um, the points you've just made. Autism is often comes with multiple other conditions like um, so you i would come across with young people you know children with autism with seizures um diabetes and other conditions but this is the first time i've heard of um the deaf community and the autism, and I would I would assume, obviously, that is sort of um, something that happens. Um, it would be good if we can make links, and that we could see w how we can work together. And I think, for me, you know, autism in any sort of like communities of these, um, um, that's the key for me. How do we raise the awareness and the understanding? But I can only understand the stigma that would come being deaf and then having an autism and then all the other issues. Um, this is amazing. I am so proud to be sitting here with all these other sisters and discussing some of the core issues that needs discussing in our community. Um, a young person with any of these problems in school, I've recently been involved in a project in Bristol looking at mental health and primary children in the Somali community. Um, and, and, and it was like, understanding the signs and symptoms and having a young person and in, in you know having anyone someone in their family to talk to about anything and making that sort of like a space somewhere in the house it's time for all of us to talk and as a parent really leading that and you know saying well you know what this happened to me i'm going to share it with you and then giving the young person the opportunity to make it okay that they can talk about anything. And I, I remember when I was in school and, and the, um, one of the lessons, the BHSE, I never ever talked about it with any of the stuff that they, they talked about um, with my parents. And I just wish they did. But like, and, and I can understand that was the culture. But now, for my children and my girls, I sit down with them and say, you know what, that is something I had gone through, but I really want to talk to you. You know, how was your day? What's happening? It's about really picking that well-being, understanding the young person at every level and becoming their friend and, and making them okay, that they can make mistakes and things happen and that it happened to you as an adult and really breaking these barriers of, you know what, I don't really go there and I don't talk about this. Um, but really, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I just want to say uh, to the ladies out there, I think I met some of you last year at Somali Week Festival, and this was the first time I've ever met uh, members of the Somali deaf community. And I have to say and um, congratulate you for coming forward and speaking to us. I think I speak for many other people that uh, we do have members of our close community and families who are deaf. Um, we're talking about the sort of disability that's not visible every day. Um, and a lot of the Somali deaf community, I mean, uh, it's amazing just to see a group of young people now sitting together who came together. And I understand that you guys have your own small community, your own club, you get together, you support each other through education and all sorts of things. And I think some of the families uh, 
who have children, for example, or young people who are deaf or hearing impaired, I think they are extremely isolated because the community at large, when we talk about disability, we, we think of someone missing a limb or someone who is blind. We don't really see deafness as, uh, as a disability because a lot of times or often we don't see that a person is deaf or we just let them uh, uh, deal with their school friends and uh, university friends and things like that. So they're not part of the family or, or, or the relatives or, or the social circle of that because no one can communicate with them. No one makes an attempt to understand them or to even um, I don't know many people who are uh, hearing people who can actually sign um, and and I think things are changing now because uh, a lot of siblings of deaf people are signing, a lot of friends of deaf people are learning to sign. It's a skill, it's a language, it's something that you actually uh, 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 you should encourage. So I have to say those young people sit in that section of the audience, thank you very much for coming forward, for uh, educating us, for seeking us out and let us you know, uh, letting us know what we're actually missing. We're missing uh, a very integral and important part of the community. So we thank you for coming forward and joining us. Hi, um, I'm, I'm deaf myself. I work in a deaf school. I'd just like to add something. Um, if parents do have children who suffer with autism, um, is it advisable for them, for the children themselves, to learn sign language? Because I know that one of my mother's friends, she's got a child who's, who suffers with autism, and they, they, he doesn't speak, but he signs really well. He refuses to speak, in actual fact. And um, if he wants to go to the toilet or wants something to eat, he uses basic sign language to show this to his mum. You know, he doesn't sort of say anything, because obviously he doesn't speak, but when he signs this, it makes things a bit more easier to understand. So um, I do advise, if you've got children who don't actually speak verbally, an easy way of communicating would be through using sign language. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, one of the main deficits of autism, as I said earlier, um, is the language. So finding other forms to communicate is the best way for them to learn. It's first getting into their world, getting for you to communicate with them. And once they feel confident for you to communicate with them, then the speech starts and using sign language is absolutely vital. Visuals, using pictures for them to communicate with you is teaching them the ability that they use some kind of communication. And remembering communication is not only using speech, it's using other forms of communication, whether it's looking. Behavior itself is a, type, is a form of communication. They're telling you something's not right. So I completely agree with you. Sign language would be vital for the autism community. And like I said, that's how my, learn, my, my, my son learned. The whole family had to learn how to sign. And it's amazing within months how he started to have language. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of time. We've had a good two hours. Thank you for your contribution and your time. I'm sorry, sir. Time's up. There's a next uh, session going to be happening. Can you please give a round of applause to Noura Abbe, Zahra Ahmed, and Nuna Hassan, ours for those. Have a lovely day and thank you again.